Mufti Ismail Ibn Musa Menk, also known as Mufti Menk, is a Muslim cleric and a Grand Mufti of Zimbabwe, born on the 27th of June 1975 in Harare, Zimbabwe. Mufti Menk is a leading global Islamic scholar. He is active in the international arena and a strong propagator of peace, justice, human rights and speaking against all forms of terrorism. He undertook his initial studies in Harare, Zimbabwe. He further went on to obtain a degree in Sharia law from the Islamic University of Medina. Following this, he went on to specialize in Islamic jurisprudence in Gujarat, India. Mufti Menk is the director of the Darul Ilm Islamic Educational Center of the Majlisul Ulama which caters for the educational needs of the Muslim population of Zimbabwe. Meng is also known especially in Eastern Africa and also teaches internationally. Meng has pledged his aid in curbing religious extremism in the Maldives. <laughs> Uh, I'm with our guest, the erudite Islamic scholar by the name of Mufti Ismail Mink, who is a Zimbabwean African like us. We share so many values together. He is from an English speaking country. Uh, we are also from English speaking country. He is from Commonwealth country and we are also from Commonwealth country. And his country has Muslims and ours also have Muslims. That's why he is here. So, Sheikh, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Syria. Thank you. Jazakumullah khair. In the first place, what, what are your impressions uh, about Syria? Hey, for the first time that he are visiting. I think it's a very, very beautiful country and what makes it beautiful is the people. Uh, the people are so warm, they are so welcoming, they are very loving and they, they really have uh, displayed the height of character. So, uh, when you came to Sierra Leone and you saw the kind of uh, crowd yesterday at the National Studio. Just, they, they were just there to hear from you. How did you feel? I felt very humbled and I felt very small in the eyes of the Almighty because everyone who was there has value in the eyes of the Almighty equivalent to mine or even more. So I was praying to the Almighty, oh, Almighty grant me humbleness and humility and make me as loved as all of these are unto you because i promise you it is only the love of the almighty that brought them there it's the message the divine message not necessarily the individual but but actually the word of god is what brought them there if it was not for the word of god or the, the almighty i don't even think they would have known me so to remain focused is something that we need uh, and I've tried to do this as best as possible. We are all brothers and sisters. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad says, mishd. People are equal, like the teeth of a comb. So there is no virtue of me over you or anyone else. What, what uh, really counts in the eyes of the Almighty is your closeness to Him. And that is displayed also by the way you treat the rest of the creatures whom the same Almighty has made. Yesterday, you feel uh, was jam-packed with uh, people, not only Muslims. Muslims were there in majority, but before you came, Christians were telling us that they were going to attend, and in indeed they attended. So this is what we call peaceful coexistence. How do how do the scholars work to maintain this, to make this work um, from now on? I think it is our duty uh, to constantly uh, make the rest of 
mankind feel respected because we are human beings no matter what faith you belong to you are deserving of my respect and it's a mutual matter i think it clearly shows that the, the teachings and preachings of the heavenly faiths are actually uh, very very broad they encompass humanity at large so if you preach the pristine divine preachings they will always resonate uh, you know, the, the, the people will definitely be able to take from that beautiful message. So I think we need to continue this and we need to understand the respect that we have for one another, the love, and we need to keep promoting it. And one of the reasons is, as you know, across the globe, uh, people are using religion in order to perpetrate crime. Then they ask us, what are your leaders doing to, to, to stop this? Well, we have shown you loud and clear, so support us, because with this, we, we who are promoting a peaceful coexistence, we definitely uh, need the support of everyone, so that we find solutions to what is happening elsewhere on the globe. Uh, it's like yeah, drawing the attention of the authorities to work together with the religious leaders. I think it's very important to work with religious leaders and to ensure that what we are promoting is very mainstream, because there is a vacuum that is usually created and it is filled sometimes by extreme elements especially on an international level now that you have the internet and everyone has access to it you know on their phones it's important for us to realize fill that vacuum with what is right if you don't someone will fill it with what is wrong so therefore i am here and like i've said before also uh, we need to promote the local scholars as much as anything else because it is through their sanctioning that i am actually here today he has traveled to many countries in the world to deliver lectures. After his visit to Ghana some few months ago, Sierra Leone was also very happy to be visited with this great Islamic scholar who has traveled to so many other African countries, including Ghana. As the many prayers and requests for the Grand Mufti to visit Sierra Leone, the Foundation of Islamic Information Sierra Leone invited the Muslim cleric to their first public lecture. He was received with open arms in Sierra Leone as thousands of people traveled from all parts of the country to converge to the historic National Stadium. The presence of many were felt, including distinguished personalities and non-Muslims also graced the occasion. The Muslim cleric who landed on the shores of Freetown on the 21st of September 2017 delivered two days of public lectures at the National Stadium on the 22nd of September and the 23rd of September. When I've been given wealth and health and goodness and happiness and every form of success that is when I will be close to Allah and so that he does not take away what he has given me. Allah says, you know that you are the Lord Allah will never take away a gift that he has given you unless you have changed somehow negatively unless you have changed Allah does not take the gift away unless you have gone away from Allah. So this means when you have a gift, get close to Allah. Ta'arraf ila Allahi fi rakhai. Ya'arif. Ya'arif ka fi shiddati. Get close to Allah during days of ease. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be close to you when you are having hardship and difficulty. My brothers and sisters, what more can I say? My brothers and sisters, what more can I say? I have come to you with a message solely from revelation. It is divine inspiration, that which is from Allah. I have spoken to you and reminded you about your duties unto Allah. Worship Allah alone. And I have spoken to you about your duties unto the rest of the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I see the love in the eyes of the brothers and sisters all over here. They Love, a lot of love that we have, mashallah. Let us learn to love for the sake of Allah. When someone is in pain, we are all in pain. When someone is in need, we all reach out to help them. When someone needs
these words of comfort, we will all go out to comfort them, inshallah. That is how we develop our nation. That is how the Ummah will progress. So my brothers and sisters, I call on you to turn back to Allah. Repent to Allah. Leave your bad ways. Your bad ways will, your bad ways will bring about only a few minutes of enjoyment. That is false enjoyment. After that, there is much regret. So the best thing for you to do is to be from among those who is grateful to the Almighty by praying. I call on you to pray and to fulfill your prayers and to pray hard to the Almighty. We are desperately in need of the mercy throughout the globe. I will be failing if I don't mention my brothers and sisters who are suffering right now in a place known as Rohingya in Burma. People are harming them, killing them. There is something known as ethnic cleansing going on there. What can we do? We pray for them. We talk to them. We try to perhaps help them in whatever way we can. Most of us, we can just pray. Do not underestimate the power of a prayer. When you pray and you ask the Almighty for something and you continue to pray, He will give it to you. Be patient. Continue praying. Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. If you have a child asking you as a mother, the child is asking you as a mother, please can you give me five dollars or one dollar or fifty cents? And you say no. And the child says please. And you say no. But I beg you. And you say no. But I love you so much. He said, Sierra Leone is an epitome of religious tolerance in the world, saying that the Muslim community is, is anxiously looking forward. Mufti Meng expressed greater satisfaction for coming to Sierra Leone, saying that his purpose to visit is to inspire Sierra Leoneans to be steadfast and work hard on prayers for peace, growth and serenity of the country. Mufti Meng is one of the top 500 most influential Muslims in the world since 2010. Mufti was honored with a honorary doctorate of social guidance by the Aldous Gate College, Philippines, and its collaborative partners, Aldous Gate College, Dublin, Ireland, on the 16th of April 2016. He was also awarded the KSPEA 2015 Awards for Global Leadership in Social Guidance, awarded by Choshin Herald. Mufti Meng, here are some amazing things about Mufti Meng. Mufti Meng was born in a well-respected Zimbabwean family. He is the eighth out of nine children. His father, Sheikh Maulana Musa Meng, is also a well-known scholar and a dai, caller to Islam, and an imam in a masjid in Zimbabwe. Even if you are having a bad day, because it will become a better day when you show your teeth, subhanAllah. And if you don't have teeth, that smile is more valuable than those who do have the teeth. Because it shows that even though you have nothing to show, you will actually be showing your lips in the smile position, subhanAllah. So my brothers and sisters, we smile for the sake of Allah. We hear that if you smile, it is an act of charity. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, تَبَسْتُمُكَ فِي وَجْهِ أَخِيكَ صَدَقَ To smile at your fellow brothers and sisters is a charity, subhanallah. Why is it a charity? It is a charity because, my brothers and sisters, what you need to know is, when I smile, I, it is actually contagious. Have you ever smiled at a little baby? The baby who cannot speak, a baby who doesn't know how to communicate with you. If you smile with that particular baby, the baby smiles back at you. Who made the baby smile? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the reason why we say it is contagious. Because if an innocent child can understand that this is joy, I'm smiling. Wallahi, I make the day of those who might be sad and as a result, my day even if I am sad, is actually made by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, do we promise that we are going to increase our smiles? Do we promise that we will increase our smiles? And we need to make sure we promise that the expression on our face is always a good one. Because that empowers you, my brothers and sisters. Trust me, it might be something small, but when you have a good expression on your face, you can change society and community just by your expression. People feel
feel less stressed, they feel less depressed because they know I am not alone, I have a whole humanity, the whole of humanity sharing with me and they will, they will be there to help me the day I need that help. My brothers and sisters, I am here in order to express my solidarity with you. I am here as a brother of yours, sometimes younger, in some cases older brother. I am here in order to tell you that we feel your pain when you went through the floods that you have gone through. We felt your pain. The mudslides that happened here, we felt your pain. We tried to reach out to you in whatever way we could. The minimum is to pray for you and this beautiful nation. Those who were affected, those who lost their lives. It's not a small matter, it is a big matter. But I want to tell you some, something even bigger than that. Something bigger than that is, my brothers and sisters, learn to be united, learn to love one another. Look at the nations that are destroyed today because they did not stand up for one another. When they had differences, they started fighting and hurting each other and becoming silent. But there is no room for violence. When it comes to Islam, we are taught that when you have a difference, you may resolve it in a respectable manner. You will not result or you will not cause violence and you will not cause a disturbance of the peace just because you differ with someone for some reason. If you have a problem with someone, deal with it in a dignified way. You are a human being, subhanAllah. People are looking at your nation and waiting for the growth that it once had began. If there was great growth that was starting but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to test us. And I look at this beautiful nation, I think to myself, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, grant it success. There are lovely people here. There are beautiful people. And the sign of it is every one of you, subhanAllah. Look at this place. It is a sign of the mercy of Allah. We need to repent. We need to give up our bad ways. No more doing that which displeases Allah. If you are committing a sin, decide now, Oh Allah, I'm going to quit this because I need your mercy. If you are doing that abomination, something that is wrong, say, Oh Allah, today is the day. I decided no more wrong. Atubu ilayka ya ilaha al-alameen. I am seeking your forgiveness, Oh of the world. Lord of the world, I am young, I am insignificant, I am small. My brothers and sisters, when I, when I see these great numbers of my own brothers and sisters all over here, some right at the top there where the light is, subhanallah, I want to tell you I feel that I am just one number from amongst you. I am no superior to any one of you. I am one number from amongst you. That's who I am. I also need the mercy of Allah. I also need the mercy of Allah. Just like you need the mercy. Mufti Menk memorized some verses of the Quran at age three. On his own, Mufti Menk was able to memorize some verses of Surah al tawbah the repentance, when he was about three years old. This he picked from the recitation of some children who used to come to their house to learn the Quran. Mufti was predicted to be a Hafiz, someone who memorizes the whole Quran. This followed an encounter when Mufti Menk was about three years old. He was told by a family friend in the presence of his father and other scholars to recite the verses of the Quran. The man once heard Mufti reciting when he visited the house. One of them then said to Mufti's father, this little boy will be a Hafiz, one who has memorized the entire Quran. Love for Knowledge Mufti Ismail Menk commenced hifs at the tender age of 9 years and completed at the age of 12. He studied Arabic, Urdu and the Hanafi Mashab from a young age while studying Sharia under his father. He also attained a degree in Sharia from the University of Medina and later specialized in Ifta at Darul Ulum Qathariya in Gujarat, India. Mufti Menk has been actively engaged in teaching, lecturing internationally, running of Islamic Educational Institute for the Underprivileged as well as the orphans. He is the head of Fatwa Department of the Council of Islamic Scholars of Zimbabwe. The visit of Mufti Menk in Sierra Leone will forever be in the history book of Sierra Leone, as it is one of the most attended events that fill the national stadium.
Thank you very much, uh, Mufti Ismail Ming. Well, you know, stability uh, is costly. It's very, very expensive. And Alhamdulillah, for now, we in Sierra Leone, we had a war in the 1990s. The later on, we had Ebola. Later on, we had more slide. We had a flooding uh, that killed so many people. Stability, uh, we, we have democracy. You know, people are vying for various positions. But as, as sometimes you find out that there are people who go to the extremes to create problems. So what is the role of the scholars in maintaining stability? I think we need to be exemplary to start with. We, we have the teachings of the Almighty. We need to display it. When anyone sees you, they can recognize this is a man of God. Immediately, because your message is filled with love, it's filled with peace. The closer you are to the Almighty, the more humble you are with the rest of the people. And this should show clearly. And then we need to continue preaching this beautiful message. While you are, uh, you know, promoting the Almighty alone, you also need to promote the coexistence between the creatures of the same Almighty. And I keep saying this. The reason is people forget that we are one family. Whoever made me, made you, and made everyone else, who gives me the right to take that life away, for example, or to harm someone who is as dear as I am to the Almighty? So, uh, what we need to learn as scholars is the people are thirsty. They are waiting for guidance. Let's seize it to be able to educate them uh, in this regard, so that uh, if we constantly do this, they, every time they think of something, Immediately there is in their minds this guidance that they received, so they will not deviate then. Hey, well, our country is also going through some kind of, uh, let's say, gender issues. Teenage pregnancy, you know, school children. We have two stages in the secondary school. We have the JSS, so they sit back here, and then that we qualify them for at the other stage, which is the senior secondary school, SS. Now they are saying that after Beke, Nabele, which means after Beke is pregnancy. So what is your advice to the parents, to the youth? We have so many children that are illegitimate in the society. I think I need to start off by saying it is not unique to your country or your society, but it is a problem across the globe. It's not just here. We need to be more responsible. We definitely need to be responsible and instill morals and values in our children. Some people complain that Islam is very strict. But in essence, if you take a look at the rulings and the teachings of religion, and Islam in particular that has more rules, it is there to guide you, to safeguard you, to ensure that these things don't happen to you because you are sometimes jeopardizing your future. You could be someone really who would serve in such a great way and be successful and yet something small has just made us, something small has made us uh, drop out. So I, I really promote and preach uh, responsibility. We need to be responsible individuals. Don't let temporary pleasure allow the destruction of your entire future. Be disciplined. Don't worry, a day will come when you will have your time to have your children, you will be able to be married, you will have your spouse, and you know, things will move. But when we want things too quickly, it becomes bad. And sometimes we blame, sometimes we tend to blame the entertainment industry uh, because of the moral values and standards dropping very heavily. You know, if you watch, for example, and I'm not swiping, but I'd like to say, sometimes if you watch music, uh, you would notice very quickly, it's not how it used to be in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It has changed. It's become nudity. Some countries have banned certain types of music because they consider it pornography. So it's the responsibility of musicians and all of us together to collectively hold our moral standards. Uh, you know, the values, don't drop them because you are going to be guilty just because you want to sell your product. You are, you, you are guilty of, of contributing towards the dropping of values. If that is the case, then we should definitely do something about it. So what I'd like to encourage all of us as human beings, let us understand we are human and we definitely are respectable creatures of the Almighty, the most respectable. But let's hold ourselves upon that. 
I think it's very important to have education about Islam because without the correct education, people are being, uh, you know, sidelined and become extreme. So when they have the correct education of Islam, that is when they understand the value of it. And I am a strong uh, proponent of, of this because I feel those who are extremists, they are ignorant of Islam. You ask them to read the Quran, they cannot even quote for you verses of the Quran because they've only heard one or two things and they have you know, uh, lost in that way. But when it comes to those who are educated, those who've learned, those who are mainstream, they will always be a cut above the rest. So it's about education and learning. I think it's important for us to make use of whatever we have on the ground in order to educate ourselves. And what is also important is your local scholars that you do have here, make sure that they sanction what you are about to enter into. Because you may not know, and you might just enter into something that is about to make you uh, a person who's going to be perhaps not an asset to your own society. You might be a liability. So just make sure that your local scholars have sanctioned what you're about to go into, uh, and then uh, I'm sure we can actually progress in that. Thank you very much for talking to uh, Stati. Barakalofi. Barakalofi. So my brothers and sisters, when we call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's important to know that you have a role to play as well. What do you want? You want to get married. So you make a dua, oh Allah, grant me a good spouse. But you have not bothered to look for anyone. You have not spoken to anyone. You have, for example, some of the sisters and some of their families believe that a female needs to just sit back and wait for a proposal to come in her direction when no one knows you exist, subhanAllah, and people are just greeting you every day, not even knowing what has happened. Your father never went out to try to talk to people who have sons, for example, or to look out for lads and so on. Good people, it is the responsibility of Waliul Amr, the guardian, the one who is looking after you, to get you married. It's the responsibility of the guardian. The guardian is considered a person who has failed if he did not actively look for a spouse for those females under his guardianship. So for us to just sit back and say, you know what, your prince, and I've heard this statement, your prince is already predestined. He will look for you and come to you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what, it might have been predestined that your prince will probably maybe only be in the akhirah. May Allah grant us goodness in the dunya as well as in the akhirah. But if we are sitting here and we'd like a spouse here, do something about it. Say the name of Allah, seek the help of Allah, but actively search for a, a spouse for those under your guardianship. It is a duty upon you. And this is what we fail to realize sometimes. I have had cases where people come and complain about things where the guardian keeps on telling them, make dua. Don't worry, it will come. Make dua. Make dua. How can you continue saying do dua or make dua and continue supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the capacity has already been given to you by Allah? Allah has given you the capacity and you don't want to use it to try and achieve. For example, if you want to drive to this masjid, if you wanted to drive here, it is not enough for you to sit in your vehicle and say, Ya Allah, take me there. Ya Allah, take me there. Ya Allah, I beg you to take me there. Ya Allah, I'm giving a charity, take me there. I'm reading this surah, take me there. I've given so much, Ya Allah, take me there. I'm your worshiper, take me there. I want to worship you, make it easy for me to go there. You have to turn on the vehicle and you have to drive. As simple as that. But sometimes we do not realize that in life, we use the opposite of that when it comes to achieving other things. Why? This was common logical example of driving. Allah gave you the car, Allah gave you the energy, you have the driver's license, you know where the place is. How dare you just sit back and blame Allah for not having gone for Salatul Jumu'ah? No, you are answerable because you sat back and you did not utilize the energy. But if a person did not have energy, if a person was immobile, paralyzed, and they couldn't even move, and they made dua, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, let someone phone me because if they could not phone, say they were paralyzed, may Allah protect us all and grant cure to those who have paralysis. May Allah grant cure to all those who are sick and ill as well. So my brothers and sisters, if a person is totally paralyzed, they can then say, Ya Allah, send someone to pick me up, Ya Allah. That's fair enough because 
then when someone comes, it will be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if nobody comes, the person is sinless. Why? Because they cannot achieve what they wanted to achieve. They had no in terms of capacity. But the minute you have the capacity, you must use it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all good. Let's go.